Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening. My name is Michael Lestrange. I'm the uh, head of the National Security College here at the ANU. Um, and at the outset, can I uh, just say that we acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet, and we pay our respects to the elders of the Ngunnawal people, uh, past and present. Uh, in that spirit, can I also welcome all of you in particular here this evening and uh, say how much uh, we at the National Security College uh, appreciate the support for this public seminar series, of which this is the first this year, and we're delighted to be co-hosting uh, this occasion um, this evening with the ANU Japan Institute, and we welcome all the members of the Institute that are here, um, thank them for the support this evening, and look forward to uh, doing this again at some stage in the future. Uh, we're focusing tonight on the uh, security policies of the new Japanese government, um, which is timely and important in many respects. At a bilateral level, Japan has been um, a critically important security and economic partner of Australia's for over six decades. Uh, regionally, uh, it carries enormous importance, as it does globally. So what Japan does in terms of its security policy uh, matters enormously to Australia, to the region uh, and to the world. And it matters particularly at a time when the balance of power is shifting between major states in our region, particularly the US, China, Japan, India, uh, Republic of Korea uh, and others. Uh, it matters when nationalisms in the region um, are rising, when territorial and resource disputes are growing, uh, and when the challenges that Japan faces itself domestically, uh, politically and economically, um, are probably more complex than they've been. So in this context, we felt that focusing on the security policies of the new Japanese government uh, would be an important and relevant way to start this public <coughs> seminar series this year. And uh, we are absolutely delighted that Professor Ricky Kirsten uh, has um, agreed to present this, this seminar. Uh, Ricky is a graduate of the Universities of Adelaide and Oxford. She's worked at universities in Japan, in the Netherlands, uh, in Australia, and came to the ANU back in 2006 as, as Dean of the Faculty of Asian Studies. Uh, she brings a real uh, depth in relation to Japan's historical experience, uh, and in relation to its foreign policy and, and political structures. Uh, so we're absolutely delighted that someone with Ricky's academic background is here. We're equally delighted that someone with her uh, practical foreign service background is here, uh, being as she was a member of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade for five years, including a posting to Tokyo. So I think bringing these dimensions of uh, government service and, and real academic uh, expertise um, uh, is a real pleasure for us and we're very much indebted to her. So Ricky, I'd now like to ask you to um, address this issue, to thank you very much and we look forward to your remarks and to the question and answer session at the end. Thank you, Michael, and thank you, everyone. Um, it's great to see so many people interested in events in the region, and particularly in Japan. And as we know, on a daily basis, uh, the news conveys disconcerting developments in one of, concerning one of the most volatile security environments in the world, uh, the Northeast Asian region. We've seen, just in the past seven days, uh, increased tensions over the Senkaku Islands, uh, which are um, effectively contested between Japan and China. Just this afternoon, we have what appears to be a nuclear weapons test conducted by uh, the DPRK. We've seen also in the last seven days a recent reactivation of tensions over the Northern Territories between Japan and Russia, causing Japan to scramble fighter jets in response to an air incursion by Russian military fighters. All of this is happening at a time when the Obama administration is in transition, having announced a new 
major security policy framework called the PIVOT, or what is now called the Rebalancing Policy Framework. Now, with new governments in place in Japan, the ROK, the DPRK and China, this transition dynamic is particularly important. And as Campbell and Steinberg noted in their recent book, Difficult Transitions, a transition is a time of particular vulnerability and risk in the realm of national security. And here in our region, we're undergoing several transitions simultaneously. Now, it's into this cauldron of instability tactical probing and strategic competition that the second Abe administration has come to power in Japan. And together with economic recovery, security and defence are the policy areas that are at the forefront of Abe's policy platform. And I think we can say in this context in particular that Japanese security policy has become the crucial variable <coughs> that will shape the security environment in our region in the short term. So what can we expect from Abe? And how will this context influence the policy choices that Abe makes? What I'd like to do today then is look quickly at Abe's track record and his stated intentions in his second administration and then take a look at how these particular contexts I've referred to might shape, influence or constrain his decision making in the realm of security policy. Looking quickly at the domestic environment, the US-Japan alliance and its rebalancing strategy and the Senkaku Islands uh, issue, I can't uh, not discuss the DPRK, but I have to confess that uh, they didn't inform me in advance of their intention to test this afternoon. So I'm happy to address this uh, during questions. And then consider what this might mean for Australia and our security policy uh, development. So what do we make of Abe in the first iteration between 2006 and 2007? Uh, barely a year uh, in office. We all know Abe by reputation. Abe's, if you like, burdened with the stereotype of being a conviction nationalist, a rightist and a hawk who wishes to see Japan's 1947 constitution revised, including Article 9, the pacifist clause. But I think we need to do more than just follow the stereotype. We need a more nuanced assessment of Abe's first brief stint in office and see what it might tell us. I think the bottom line really, when we consider Abe between 2006 and 2007, his first administration, is that we see uh, a combination of pragmatism and ideology emerging concurrently simultaneously and in fact with a degree of dissonance within his security and defence policies. No one would have expected the hawk to be the one to re-establish a good relationship with China immediately following the Koizumi administrations. But that is indeed what Abe did, contrary to our expectations and contrary to his image. He did so partly by refraining from visiting Yasukuni Shrine, something that Prime Minister Koizumi uh, did uh, during his uh, six years in office. We also see that Abe passed a crucial piece of legislation, the National Referendum Law, governing how the Constitution may be revised when it comes to the final revision stage, which is a national referendum. Now, this is uh, quite uh, significant if we're talking about constitutional revision at all. It couldn't indeed have happened without the passing of this law. He achieved this in his first term. He also infamously revised the 1947 Fundamental Law on Education, which amongst other things made patriotism a legitimate goal 
of education policy in Japan. Now, all of these things, of course, attracted considerable uh, opprobrium, but the China and Yasukuni shrine issues were not what people expected, and we would do well to be mindful of that. Abe also upgraded the status of the Self-Defence Force Agency or the Self-Defence Agency to ministerial status. Abe did other things as well, including convene uh, the famous Yanai Commission to consider Japanese security policy and defence policy with a particular mandate to consider under what circumstances Japan might engage in collective self-defence. Traditional um, interpretations, official interpretations of Japan's constitution, uh, make collective self-defence something that Japan is legally constrained from pursuing. Uh, so it's interesting that he commissioned um, Yanai and his body of experts to consider this. But I want to look even more deeply to see what we mean by all of by remarking on all of these developments in his first term. We can call him a pragmatist. Contrary to his personal inclination and preferences, he prioritised good relations with Asia in his foreign policy. You could even argue that he was pragmatic domestically as well, but he was very systematic in doing so. His pragmatism is on show partly through what I mentioned earlier. You can't revise a constitution if the legislation is not in place to facilitate that. <clears throat> so it's very pragmatic of him to pursue that policy, but he did more than that, and this is the nuance that I think we need to appreciate. What Abe did in his first term was phrase security and defence policy in normative terms. Now, normally, ordinarily in Japan, we consider pacifism to be the signifier of post-war Japanese national identity, including national identity projection. Abe elevated security and defence onto a normative plane in the way he discussed security and defence. And I'm going to go into that a little bit further. Part of the way that Abe talked about security and defence as a national identity question, as opposed to a pragmatic or realist policy area, was the ambivalence he showed towards the United States when he was doing so. Abe is, on the face of it, unequivocally in favour of the US-Japan alliance, and this includes his first term in office. But when Abe talks about revising the constitution, embracing collective self-defence for Japan, he expresses this in such a way that it represents an explicit attempt at distancing Japan from association with the US, either historically or in a contemporary frame. And this is something I think that marked not only his first term in office as Prime Minister, but his copious writings <coughs> as well, infamously the Towards a Beautiful uh, Country book, but many other interviews that he's given over the years, he's quite consistent. So instead of just labelling Abe as a rightist, extremist, hawk, neo-nationalist, we ought to understand what is underpinning that, the real substance of that, and that's what I'd like to pursue a little bit more deeply when we consider Abe in this second iteration. And you can see uh, in that uh, photo on the left the victory sign, and behind him is the slogan of the LDP during the December election last year, Nihon o Torimodosu, let's take Japan back. Uh, from what? Um, it's a good question. Um, I'm not sure I heard it answered properly. But what I'd like to do now is consider in more depth the contexts in which Abe returns triumphantly to the prime ministerial position. And starting with the political and economic context domestically, 
there's little doubt that the problems that were first optimistically referred to as the lost decade are now well and truly entering their third decade. And this has had consequences. One of these consequences is the collapse of the Japanese political spectrum and effectively uh, the emergence of new political forces, um, including some um, that achieved uh, 54 seats in the recent election, so uh, more than a token number. And we see this is quite important for a number of reasons because, uh, amongst other things, these new political forces share Abe's disposition towards constitutional revision, security and defence policy. Uh, this is quite um, significant for a number of reasons. We know that the LDP won a landslide victory in the December election, but we need to qualify that. In the proportional representation segment of the electorates that were up, to, up for grabs in that election, he only effectively won 28% of the vote. When we consider also that in the single seat electorates, um, Overall, the voter turnout was 10% less than in the previous election, so voter disinterest and disaffection was a factor. Also, the fact that the opposition was split, and they split the vote between them. It is not safe to assume that Abe's election victory represents an overwhelming endorsement of his platform. It is safe to assume that at present, in the lower house, when we combine Abe's seats with those of the Japan Restoration Party, and if we can count in the coalition partner, the Kormet, or the Clean Government Party, he now has a two-thirds majority of the lower house. This is step one towards constitutional revision. That is the significance of that. But we need to qualify because it does not represent an overwhelming popular endorsement of his agenda, which we will consider in a moment. Now, we know also that Japan's economy remains stagnant. Uh, we're in the third decade. This is um, not just a question of, of flat or low growth. It's high sovereign debt. It's a demographic time bomb. It's a restriction on the participation of women in the full-time workforce and the emergence of a generation in Japan that does not know or experience Japan as an economic superpower any longer. It's a generational impact that we're now witnessing in Japan. I think this is um, significant. It's also significant that the LDP released the text of a new draft constitution in, in May 2012, uh, prior to the um, advent of Abe in December uh, of that year. And uh, this draft constitution included um, provisions which would make revision of the constitution easier, which would name the emperor as head of state, depict Japan's military as a military force instead of a self-defence force, and would give the Prime Minister emergency powers in the case of a security or a defence emergency. It is notable that in this draft, pacifism retains its primary position as the national identity norm. So he's not tossing pacifism out the window, he's um, doing other things around that um, sacrosanct value in post-war Japanese political life. Now, if we look at security policy, what happened before the advent of Abe? We saw a really significant development in the framing of Japanese security policy in the form of the 2010 National Defence Program guidelines, which identified a concept of dynamic defence and grey zone conflicts as the guiding uh, strategic framing for the future development of um, Japan's uh, defence capability. Now, this also included a significant force posture shift from the north 
to the southwest, which was correctly uh, and widely understood as designating <laughs> China as the primary or principal threat in Japan's region. Um, something that the Russian incursions in recent days perhaps blew out of the water. But um, this is the context that Abe walks into. We also see that before Abe assumes office the second time around, the contentious issue over the relocation of the Futenma Air Base within Okinawa has been successfully decoupled in policy terms from the relocation of troops to Guam, something that up to this point has really made that a complex issue, an alliance issue between Japan and the US. As I've said, we've seen the reactivation of territorial disputes and this creates a certain atmosphere within which Abe <coughs> is pursuing his defence and security objectives. And we've seen the advent of a new US strategy within which the US-Japan alliance needs to be reconceptualised or at the very least tweaked. It is not business as usual if this strategy is to be given substance in terms of military strategy, something that hasn't yet happened. So what has Abe said he will do? He has said rather a lot. He's declared uh, an intention, a desire to significantly increase defence spending for the first time in 11 years that a uh, defence expenditure increase um, has been announced and contrary to the 2010 National Defence Program guidelines. He has also talked about increasing um, the number of personnel in uniform uh, by 287. Uh, currently, the membership of the Self-Defence Forces is 228,000. This is the first increase in eight years um, and the biggest increase in 20 years. If we look deeply into these um, apparently significant developments, overwhelmingly the focus of these increases is on intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance activities. It's an ISR focus. Um, that these increases are dedicated to. And you can tell this from the toys that Abe wants to buy, um, <coughs> early warning aircraft, um, uh, ASDF F-15s, uh, patrol helicopters, mine sweeping and transport helicopters, for example. And this suggests a certain force posture and a certain defence capability, uh, which of course um, is relevant. He's he has retracted, he has put back <coughs> in the shelf the National Defence Program guidelines of 2010. Um, he has also initiated a revision in discussions with the US on the 18th of January during Foreign Minister Kishida's visit to Washington DC, a revision of the guidelines that govern how Japanese and US forces operate together in times of um, emergency as well as in under normal circumstances. So uh, he's really uh, come quickly out of the gates here. As I've said, he's stated his intention to explore the potential for Japan to legally embrace collective self-defense, he wants to revise the constitution and in specifically, people assume this is Article 9. It's not Article 9 yet, but we are on a systematic path in that direction. So what we see here is a proposal to revise Article 96, the clause that governs <coughs> under what circumstances a referendum can be put to the people and basically this is a two-thirds majority of both houses of parliament. He thinks that bar is too high, he wants it lowered to a simple majority. And we know that Japan is heading for a half upper house election in July this year. Now we don't yet know how well Abe is going to do in this half upper house election. In case he doesn't do as well as he might like, 
lowering the bar will still facilitate uh, constitutional revision. But at this stage, it's a systematic step from the national referendum law to Article 96. Now, that's not all. He wants to establish a national security council that mirrors that um, which exists in the US. We also see that in diplomacy, Abe has sent envoys to China and the ROK on the face of it a very sensible thing, given the territorial disputes that are currently unsettling the region. Abe has also visited Vietnam, Thailand and Indonesia following earlier visits by Deputy Prime Minister Asor to Burma, Foreign Minister Kishida to Singapore, Brunei and Manila and Canberra, and security was high on the agenda of every single one of those visits. He has also, uh, together with the Philippines, denounced an intention to upgrade maritime security cooperation with the Philippines. And the Wall Street Journal has reported that Abe has already um, embarked on something, I think, initiated under NODA, um, on constructing self-defence force bases on the islands of Yonaguni and Ishigaki, islands that are much closer to the Senkaku Islands and Taiwan than uh, Naha in Okinawa. So uh, bringing the fight forward, I think, is uh, one way we might uh, consider this. It's a Wall Street uh, Journal report, and uh, I think uh, it's watch this space. Now, what else has Abe done? Abe has also continued his irrational or ideological theme. He's declared his intention to release his own statement about Japan's acts in World War II, which suggests a questioning of the 1995 Murayama apology. He has openly cast doubt on the validity of the 1993 statement by Chief Cabinet Secretary Kornow acknowledging the existence of comfort, comfort women, so-called, and the complicity of the state in forcibly recruiting uh, women into those um, so-called comfort stations. He is continuing his drive to uh, reform, as he calls it, uh, Japan's education system. In particular, Abe is concerned at the requirement to uh, approve of history textbooks for use in high schools that acknowledges and anticipates the sensitivities of regional or neighbouring countries. So we can see from all of this uh, a certain degree of uh, consistency between his first brief stint in office, and he's come out of the gate really fast. But I think there are three main indicators statements that Abe has made in, in, in official and unofficial contexts that give us quite clear indicators of what Abe aspires to in his security and defence policy. Now, we know that on the 28th of January, Abe addressed the Japanese parliament in his inaugural <coughs> policy speech. And in that speech, he struck a theme of crisis. And given the last week, who can blame the guy? He referred to this situation that Japan finds itself in today as an array of crises threatening Japan's future. And this is something that for him includes a crisis in our diplomacy and security, unquote. He also implied that this crisis had been exacerbated by a deterioration in Japan's relations with the US, uh, really a backhander, um, a slapping down of the previous um, DPJ administrations. But it is elsewhere that things get interesting. On the 27th of December, um, in a piece he submitted or put his name to for Project Syndicate, Abe dropped some clangers, and it starts with referring to the South China Sea as Lake Beijing. It 
also in that speech refers to Japan as a, quote, mature maritime democracy. And envisages the formation of what he is calling an Asian democratic security diamond, comprising Australia, India, Japan, and Hawaii, to, quote, safeguard the maritime commons stretching from the Indian Ocean region to the Western <coughs> Pacific. He also declared it desirable for Japan to join the Five Power Defence Arrangements Group and to see Europe return to the Pacific as maritime powers. I told you it was interesting. I was right, wasn't I? <laughs> Now, in all of this, we see some interesting continuities from his previous administration, but we see some interesting tweaking that reflects a keen sensitivity of US security and defence priorities and the rebalancing strategy in particular. The countries he visited on his um, trip through Southeast Asia mirror very precisely the rise of Southeast Asia in US um, strategy towards Asia and the Pacific. I think we need to start calling it the Indo-Pacific. Abe has openly embraced the Indo-Pacific and he is echoing and mirroring the priorities that have appeared in US policy towards the region. The rise of the maritime domain as the dominant focus of security policy planning in the US as indeed it is becoming in Australia and in other regional um, countries, neighbouring countries, is partnered here with his normative backbone, the democracy, a mature maritime democracy. And the diamond, I think, requires um, explanation. And he gave us one. Unfortunately, because of the Algerian hostage crisis, uh, he didn't actually deliver this speech in Jakarta. However, it is significant because it consolidates these two other uh, messages that we have derived from these other uh, platforms. Delivered on the 18th of January and entitled The Bounty of the Open Seas, five new principles for Japanese democracy. It continued and elaborated on the themes in his project syndicate article, including the uh, security diamond. In fact, it sounds a bit like Obama speaking in Canberra when he said, Japan's national interest lies eternally in keeping Asia's seas unequivocally open free and peaceful, in managing them as the commons for all the people of the world where the rule of law is fully realised. These are the themes Obama brought to the table. The rule of law, playing by the rules. Uh, the importance of the global commons and using security policy as a global good, continuing the rhetoric of international cooperation that accompanied Koizumi's steps and security policies before him. He also warns about allowing the international commons to become places ruled by might, and he places Japan in normative terms besides the US. Japan, he says, is Asia's largest maritime democracy and a liberal capitalist state, second only to the US. So, this is something where he sees the US alliance with Japan as encompassing the two oceans, the Indian and the Pacific, affecting a network and strengthening our ties with maritime Asia. All of these things, I think, give us a clue of how we should assess Abe. I think, as I have suggested, we are seeing significant continuity in the essential themes of his first brief term in office. And again, we see this 
underlying principle, the systematic approach to policy, being packaged with short-term pragmatism and a normative undercurrent that on the face of it seems to contradict, if not undermine, the pragmatism in his external policy. Definitely Abe appears mindful of US concerns in his diplomacy. But we also see something significant. He has ditched the 2010 National Defence Program guidelines and yet I gave you a long list of policy initiatives that he is pursuing as I speak. Security policy is being made without a strategic framework. And I think this is of concern. It really puts the cart before the horse. And we're seeing significant security policy development um, as well. We also see that value-driven diplomacy is back and the arc of freedom and prosperity that uh, signified his first term and Foreign Minister Assel's agenda is definitely back and so we need to take it seriously. And we need to take it seriously primarily because it seems to undermine second guess, if not contradict, his pragmatic policy forays. And this is where the ambivalence regarding the US remains a factor. Now, how do we deal with the policy initiatives that are now the context for his policy development? With the so-called rebalancing strategy of the US, it has a certain thrust, and it's important that we understand it very quickly. It's about a geographical stretch of the strategic framing of US policy to the Indian uh, Ocean and Pacific Ocean and to Southeast Asia. It's not about Japan. It's not about Northeast Asia. It is a pivot not only to Asia, but within Asia. It's also lending new strategic coherence and the bundling of policies, many of which predate the Obama administration, the first Obama administration. But it lends them a new st strategic coherence that I think sees security become the principal integrating mechanism for US policy in this Indian Pacific region. It's designed to counter the perception of decline, relative decline on the part of the US, and we see an unmistakable focus on the maritime sphere, cyber and space. What does all of this mean for Japan? I think for Japan, it really does mean burden shifting, not burden sharing. Japan is, along with other allies and partners of the US, going to be expected simply to do more, with more. For Japan, it also means what some might call a militarization of other regional relationships, and the Philippines is one example of that. But we also see Japanese aid policy increasingly being focused on a security and defence <coughs> dimension instead of a straight humanitarian focus. As I said, security is the integrating mechanism. It means that you cannot pick the US-Japan alliance in security terms and then say, oh no, I don't think we'll take the Trans-Pacific Partnership, thank you very much. It is an integrated strategy where trade, security, defence, investment, people-to-people -people exchanges are bundled in US thinking. Japan cannot pick. It's all or nothing. And I think it increases the pressure on Japan to resolve the dissonance between the letter of the law in Article 9 and actual <coughs> security practice, particularly post-dating the Koizumi administrations and 9-11. All of these things, I think, are significant for Japan. But it also means that we can expect the significance, the nature 
and the role of Okinawa and the bases that are currently focused on Okinawa to change. The utility of Okinawa in the US alliance system will change. And we're going to see the negotiation of that process in the course of the second Obama administration and the second Abe administration. Of particular concern is the Senkaku problem. And I'm going to, rather than describe what this is, I'd rather talk about its significance, particularly for Abe's security policy. The Senkaku issue, in my opinion, has the potential to undermine the credibility of the US alliance system. That's a big thing to say. I'm happy to say it. I think if the US demonstrates any reluctance to intervene militarily in a circumstance that Japan designates as meeting the provisions of Article 5 of the US-Japan Security Treaty, of an armed attack on Japan, the alliance system will be fatally <coughs> undermined. I think the Senkaku issue also is significant because it will do something else, and that is it will challenge the core assumptions of the utility of the alliance itself. The alliance is based on a core proposition from Japan's point of view, the defence of Japan. Bases are hosted by Japan in return for the defence of Japan. The Senkaku issue could conceivably, I think, undermine the basic premise of the Yoshida Doctrine which has delivered that core strategic bargain between Japan and the US. It also, I think, potentially weakens Japan's regional diplomacy and efficacy as a counterbalancer to China. <coughs> and this is where the ideology comes in, because Japan needs to act in concert with Southeast Asia and ASEAN if it is to effectively counterbalance China. If Abe continues to evoke World War II, to undermine the apology, to second guess the comfort women recognition. There is no way that Japanese diplomacy in Southeast Asia will succeed. It is that significant. Japan needs to put World War II to bed in order to achieve its fundamental security objectives. <coughs> the other thing the Senkaku issue potentially um, is doing is exposing the dissonance between Japan and the US on a number of issues. And for the sake of time, um, I can't go into this in detail, but partly it's the assumption about collective self-defence. Is it something that is going to enhance interoperability between Japan and US forces? Or is it what Abe has said in the past that he wants to achieve, which is using collective self-defence to achieve greater autonomy for Japan within the umbrella of the US alliance system. They are not the same. I think it also fascinatingly reverses the momentum of the Japan-US alliance, because up until now, for over 65 years, the US has been leaning on Japan to increase its defence capabilities, to rearm, to come to the party. Japan's self-imposed constraints on security and defence policy, the 1% ceiling on defence spending, the three non-nuclear principles, the weapons export ban, to name the three, all of these were motivated by a desire to prevent Japan from being entrapped in a US defence agenda. Now, Japan is under Abe actively trying to entrap the US in a Japanese security agenda. 
and all of this is happening around the Senkakas. That's why I think it's so important. Okinawa, I've said the status may, may change, and this is principally because <coughs> fixed large bases are no longer the foundations for US defence thinking when it comes to the Indian and Pacific regions. The, lo the local resistance to the Ftemma base of relocation to Henoko are more deeply entrenched than before, and the US, in my discussions with US officials, they are getting sick of it. It is too hard. We're talking about a different footprint for US forces throughout the region, and a big fat base on Okinawa doesn't necessarily fit the bill any longer. Instead, I think we might see other bases within Japan upgraded, more joint use of facilities. And I think we see also emerging out of the Okinawa conundrum, contradictory imperatives driving Abe's policy. <coughs> he insists that he needs to prioritise the defence of Japan. Well, of course he does. He's Prime Minister of Japan. And security is framed as national identity. But by correlating security with national identity, almost a normative attempt to supplant pacifism as the signifier of the post-war Japanese state, Abe is constantly doing this by enforcing distancing from the US alienation from the US, and this simply does not add up to a coherent policy. Abe is talking about enhancing Japan's independent capability, and he wants to entrap the US uh, for the defence of Japan, but how can he do that if the US is holding back the articulation of what Abe considers to be a proper, independent, post-war national identity. That's a conundrum. There are also issues about the extent to which the public in Japan is aware of the depth, the sheer depth of interoperability that exists today between Japanese self-defence forces and US forces. I am certain that the Japanese public isn't aware of the true extent of it. The democratic underpinning of this alliance relationship is lacking. And we can see in this campaign poster, which is from the Japan Communist Party, saying it's time to stop doing what America tells us to do, with a little Okinawan um, temple dog on top of the roof, just to make the point. Implications for Australia. I think we need to actively play a role in shaping this new evolution of the Japan-US alliance. Yes, the US-China relationship is the core bilateral relationship of concern to us all, but for Australia, we need to be equally mindful of how the Japan-US alliance is going to evolve. If it, indeed, we need to actively try and shape it. At the same time, we need to try and avoid entrapment. Japan is going to try and lock us in. So is Korea. So is China. How do we do that and at the same time make the US alliance system, of which we are an active member, a viable proposition? Because without spoke-to-spoke -spoke relations in the hub-and-spoke system, we don't have a viable new alliance structure to express the rebalancing strategy. We need to also accept that our bilateral security relationship with Japan cannot be an inwardly focused bilateral one. It is going to be mobilised into regional environments. And we need to have an idea of what that's going to look like. And there are a number of challenges here, but uh, I know that I'm exceeding my time and Michael will kill me. But, <laughs> but what we see as the principal challenges are, I think, these. We can't just embark on this magnitude of strategic transition 
without at the same time reinforcing the confidence-building measures of engagement and balancing that also play a role in this new emerging US alliance system of which we are a part. But we cannot at the same time ignore the essential and multiple layers of dissonance that exist at present in Japan's security identity. Abe is talking like the Prime Minister of a great power. Japan is effectively a middle power and arguably poised to make an important contribution as a middle power. Does Japan want independent independence and autonomy within the US alliance system and particularly within an extended deterrence environment? Or does it want to become closer and more integrated with the US alliance system? Does the pivot or rebalancing mean for Japan a lesser role in the US alliance than it has to date? And if so, how do we reassure Japan and integrate Japan in this new and emerging environment? And finally, as we learned today, we have to accept that Japan is at the pointy end of regional volatility. Yes, Abe has a reputation as a neo-nationalist, a hawk, a rightist, an extremist. Put yourself in his shoes today, after the week he's had, and think about how do you articulate a coherent strategy for your nation, for its security and defence, in this volatile, evolving, transitional moment? I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Ricky. I think that was um, a really uh, coherent, informed, um, insightful address. I think it raised a number of very important questions, but it actually gave us some very clear opinions, which I'm sure will be the basis for some interesting questions. So the floor is open. Um, uh, my aim here is to keep these questions as precise as we can, get through as many as we can, and hopefully to get you, well, not hopefully, we will get you out the door within a half hour or so. Um, so could I ask you to um, declare where, who you are, where you're from, if you have a, an organisation, and um, Ricky can take it from there. Thank you. ACT, you spoke about Abe increasing the defence budget. You talked about maritime power. Has he spoken about increasing the air force, land forces, or is it all maritime? No, it's not all maritime. Um, Although I think it's important to mention um, the incredible um, budget um, bonanzas that have come um, by the way of the Japan Post Guard, uh, Coast Guard. Yes. Um, yes. This, is, this is really quite um, significant and this predates Abe. This is not an Abe initiative. Uh, Noda had this well in hand um, as did his uh, predecessors and this is not included in the notional 1% ceiling. Um, no, it's a Coast Guard, it's not a military. Uh, it's been handy up until now. Um, but Japan is definitely um, signing up for enhancing um, all manner of um, intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance um, gathering, including an independent um, space um, intelligence capability. So we're seeing, we're seeing it in, in all um, dimensions, not just maritime, but it is the um, acknowledged dominant um, threat of um, anti-area access denial um, in the areas immediately surrounding uh, Japan that is driving the focus on the maritime arena in the strategic thinking of many countries, and Japan is obviously at the front of the queue there, because so much of, of energy, um, uh, food, 
is passing through those, those waters. So whenever we hear references to the commons, this is really what they're talking about. Someone stole the pen I had sitting here, otherwise I would write down notes. Do, may I borrow Take a pen? One. Thank you. Any other questions? Doug. Uh, uh, Doug Keaton from Orwell, eh? uh, Thank you for your illuminating presentation, Ricky. Um, it was also pretty scary in places. <laughs> Uh, intentionally or otherwise, um, I'm not sure where you're suggesting these events will lead us. You know, where does all this end up? There's been some pretty scary stuff in the, the newspapers recently, you know, people talking about tinder boxes floating in the West Pacific and bursting into flame and stuff. Um, but from what you've said, uh, if we just look at the Japanese side, uh, Abe's actions have a record of being pragmatic, even if his rhetoric uh, tends to be ideological. And major powers don't go to war through accident. You know, military clashes like we're seeing can arise by accident, but wars don't. So I presume you're not saying there's going to be a war. Uh, what are you saying? Is it that uh, China is going to be, find Japan a real handful and that will make for interesting times uh, during the power transition? Uh, I, I, love, I love this question. Um, no, I'm not um, predicting an imminent um, outbreak of war. I am uh, predicting uh, brinksmanship-like um, probing, which, which we're already seeing, uh, particularly around the Senkakus, with a view not to prodding Abe so much as, as um, suggesting that there are limits to the commitment of the United States to its alliance partners. I think that's what's going on. And when we look at Article uh, 5 of the US-Japan Security Treaty, the language is really important. It refers specifically to an armed attack that is designated as such by Japan. Now, I can envisage, for example, a little skirmish, and we saw the weapons focusing radar um, uh, active from Chinese military vessels to Japanese um, military vessels on the 19th and 30th of January. Um, I can envisage um, an incident that Japan desperately wants to call an armed attack, that the US mobilises frantically to prevent it being referred to as such, and if it is, retraction um, immediately. That's the kind of thing I see. And also, we have to acknowledge that the US um, rebalancing strategy is under stress uh, through uh, austerity, amongst other things. Uh, is the US going to overpromise and underdeliver because of its own domestic uh, economic situation? Indeed, will, will the allies of the US uh, similarly um, cut back? Australia, uh, indeed, is doing so. Japan is increasing its defence expenditure, but it hasn't done that for 11 years. And we look at uh, uh, China, uh, we guess it's 10% a year growth in defence expenditure. Of course, we have to have a, a base that makes sense of these figures. But it isn't unreasonable or um, concerning that Japan is, some would say, belatedly building its defence capability. I think it is significant that we're looking at a focus on intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance and not offensive power projection. So, no, not war. And secondly, I think it's about the US more than it's about Japan.
Hi, Lynn. Um, hello, Professor Kirsten. Um, thank you very much for your um, interesting presentation. I have two questions. Um, you mentioned that um, the recent victory of the LDP in the election does not necessarily reflect the popularity of Mr. Abe in the Japanese society. Given such fact, do you think that um, Mr. Abe will be able to maintain his cabinet for the next four years, or do you think um, he will follow the recent trend in the Japanese politics? Mm -hmm. And the second question is that, um, how do you think that um, relationship between Japan and Korea will um, turn out in the next four years of um, Mr. Abe's, um, well, Mr. Abe ruling Japan, because obviously he's in, well, Korea and Japan are both US alliance, and they share some security interests, such as the um, DPRK. However, um, it is very likely that some of um, Mr. Abe's interests in domestic policy will provoke um, the anger of the ROK government. Okay. Um, I teach them too well, Michael. <laughs> um, Len, will, will Abe last four years? I think every single Japanese is praying um, that he will, just so that Japan can be taken seriously. <laughs> um, it, it is not a time for musical chairs, and I think uh, the feeling in Japan also is that there needs to be uh, some form of consistency. Having said that, Japan is in the middle of long-term political realignment. Every time there's an election, we think it's, it's, it's reached some kind of decisive end point, but it's part of a much longer process. This is going to go on for many years, in my view. Um, the DPJ has sunk significantly. The left has just about disappeared um, from formal Japanese politics. There is no representation for um, exclusive um, pacifism in the political parties that currently inhabit the Japanese parliament. Um, the new political forces that have emerged are clearly responding to dissatisfaction in the electorate but it's going to take longer for policy coherence to knit these forces together in a viable um, governing um, coalition. And I think we're looking at coalition governments in the long term in Japan. This is not a hiccup. A lot hinges on the July half upper house election and what kind of political bargains can be struck between the new emerging political forces the established political forces and how much policy coherence <coughs> underpins it as opposed to short-term opportunism. That's the main danger. Um, I can't predict whether he's going to last, but those are the challenges <coughs> facing him. Uh, Japan ROK relations are of uh, incredible importance. Um, there is no coherent um, US alliance system in an expanded region without a good relationship between Japan and the Republic of Korea. And both sides have irresponsibly, in my view, um, sought to set back what was following the Australia-Japan template, a security agreement, leading to an acquisition and cross-servicing agreement, leading to an information security agreement. This consolidation and institutionalisation of the bilateral security relationship is measured um, and it has a good democratic underpinning. It is evolving rather than being imposed in an emergency situation. And until very recently, this was the pattern, um, the template that Japan and Korea were following until the um, uh, breakdown over <coughs> Tokto or Takeshima um, came out uh, before um, Abe starts second guessing the comfort women issue. Even the United States finds this unacceptable. So it's very important that that they get this right. And I know there is incredible pressure being brought to bear by the US 
on both Japan and the Republic of Korea. And this recent um, test uh, this afternoon uh, by the Nuclear North simply underpins the absolute necessity of this being done sooner rather than later. Thank you for your talk, Jonathan Cheng at the East Asian Bureau of Economic Research and the Coombs Policy Forum. Uh, we talk very much about the US shift to Asia, but not very much about the Russian shift to Asia. And we've seen last year with APEC, etc., that Russia is really uh, pushing the change in its, uh, not just its rhetoric, but where it's looking towards for investment, etc. And forgetting about what's happened over the past week, how do you see Japan either taking advantage of, of leveraging the Russians, Russia's engagement in Asia and its emergence as, in many ways, an Asian rather than European power? Mm. There is um, a, a kind of... There is an opportunity in existence, I think, for Japan and Russia to get past the Northern Territories issue. Even though um, particularly um, Medvedev has made this slightly more complicated by upgrading Russian investment um, in the Northern Territories and effectively excluding consideration of Japan in Russia's own medium and long-term strategic um, planning. Uh, it's like a slap in the face for Japan not even to be mentioned <laughs> in Russian strategic thinking. So the bar is higher. At the same time, there is um, a precedent for a deal, a two plus two deal, um, to sort out the Northern Territories question, which frankly, in this environment of, of um, hyper-nationalism and territorial disputes, plural, um, becomes harder too. The main potential for um, Russia and Japan is in the energy sector. And this is um, Japanese investment in these enormous uh, pipelines through uh, the Russian Far East, uh, the mutual interest that has the potential of binding them, uh, these two countries together, even if it is utilitarian and opportunistic. It can become the foundation for something else. Uh, the, the recent incursion, I think, is, is uh, fascinating because it reeks of opportunism. Uh, just when the Senkaku issue goes up a notch, um, there's Russia uh, causing trouble. And hey, North Korea's come to the party too. So um, the past week, I think, just underscores the importance for Japan of settling systematically these territorial disputes. And I think Japan could go a, should go a considerable uh, way um, in order to achieve that. Um, and Russia, I think, is probably the easiest of them all in the present climate. I can't see. If we could just um, keep the questions and answers uh, crisp because I know there's a lot of people and okay. we've got about 10 minutes. Thank you. Uh, Miki Omori from Japanese Embassy. Uh, and first, I'd like to thank you, uh, Professor Kirsten, about very extensive analysis of uh, what we are eager to know. And uh, I also like to express my, and uh, on the behalf of the Embassy, our appreciation uh, of the audi all the audience to show uh, such a deep, in-depth uh, interest into what's ongoing in Japan. And uh, rather than making a uh, asking you a question, I'd like to make a few supplementary comments on, on uh, what you, you described. Um, at the outset of the, your, your statement, you, you said that um, Abe's uh, policy is much more nuanced. And I think that the description is a very much a, a acute uh, way of describing what Mr. Abe uh, is uh, now going to carry out. Um, you, you talked about the difference between uh, Abe 1.0 and Abe 2.0, and the biggest di difference uh, between them is uh, Abe 2.0 knows what was a failure in Abe 1.0. Do you think so? Do you think he's learned? Yeah, he, he, he needs to learn because... Uh, <laughs> 
So there, there are certain uh, continuity, of course, but uh, uh, what we see in, in uh, Mr. Abe's attitude is uh, very, very cautious uh, compared to, to when he came into power first in 2006. And uh, uh, in, in his uh, first statement to the Diet you, you raised, uh, he, he placed the priority, the uh, utmost priority at this mom moment to uh, restoration, of Jap uh, restoration and recovery of Japanese economy. And uh, uh, in his intention, he would probably uh, raise popularity towards the July election and uh, after securing uh, majority in the upper house, uh, he may start thinking about uh, how he would forge his own national security policy or strategy. And until that point, uh, uh, despite what has been speculated on the, on, in the media, uh, there are many, too many speculations. For example, uh, you talked about this uh, big surge in defense budget. That was uh, the, the amount you, you, you raised over there was uh, one on the paper, but uh, actually the truth of the matter, uh, the, the intended amount of raise in the defense budget was uh, reduced by, by two, uh, one third, I think. Two thirds? Reduced to one third. But this is a moving negotiation, isn't it? Yeah, with uh, with the uh, budget authority. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, Abe's uh, famous uh, uh, security diamond uh, initiative, uh, that was uh, something nobody in the government knew, because uh, although it was it was on the post on on particularly uh, Australian Financial Review paper on 27th of December. One day after uh, Abe-san was sworn in, um, it, indeed, what we found out was that that was uh, first uh, posted in November, even before uh, we knew there were going to be an election. And uh, uh, Mr. Abe said it was uh, uh, written on his own behalf, not as a Prime Minister of Japan. His name is on it. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> So there's no, no way to deny uh, what, what, uh, what's in Mr. Abe's thinking uh, in depth, but uh, there are many things yet to be forged, uh, maybe toward after, after, toward, uh, toward after the election, and uh, he emphasizes uh, dialogue and uh, uh, talks with partners. So we are hopeful that uh, through dialogues with uh, friendly partners like Australia or even some, some of the, the, the crisis situation, uh, discussion, discussion with uh, uh, our ROK colleagues or, or Beijing colleagues, uh, Abe-san's foreign policy and security policy will be formulated uh, um, more to a comfortable way. Thank you. Do you want a quick write of reply, Ricky? Oh, no, I, I batted in. It's OK. <laughs> <laughs> OK, can we move on? Just here, thanks. Um, my name is uh, Emma Campbell. I'm from the Strategic Defence Studies Centre here at AME. Thank you very much for a, a really fascinating presentation. I'd like to ask you um, just about the state of democracy in Japan, because um, you have raised many concerning and challenging issues, and my impression, and I'm no expert, is that there is not a lot of discussion going on about this in Japan, and it's being accepted quite quite quietly and um, so I'd like to, to ask you about that. Thanks Emma. Uh, very thoughtful <coughs> for you to ask that question. I think the thing that has um, been most troubling about Japanese um, security policy and I include uh, peace building, peacemaking in the rubric of security policy the most disturbing thing has been the democratic deficit that underpins interpretations of Article 9. That these are uh, performed by bureaucrats in the Cabinet Legislation Bureau, uh, not by the judiciary, not by the ele elected representatives um, in the Japanese parliament. And I think there does need to be, that's why I spoke about the need for transparency concerning the extent and depth of interoperability between Japan and the US, for example. There needs to be public understanding, acceptance and support 
for what is happening and what may about to happen in Japanese uh, security policy development. And uh, it has to start uh, by having uh, the voice of the people represented, either um, political representation through elections, uh, through referendums, um, also through politicians taking responsibility for policies that are tested before the electorate, based on sufficient information being put before them. This is where I think democracy comes into it. There are other issues um, about uh, Japan's democracy. The, the huge gerrymander that continues to support conservative political forces in Japan um, surely has to be addressed if we're going to see a correlation between electoral success and the will of the people. So that, those are two examples, but I think we need to have a long lunch and talk about them. <laughs> <laughs> two, more, two more quick questions in the middle up there. Hi, my name is Joel Rathus. I'm here as a private citizen. Uh, thanks very much for the talk, Ricky. Um, the first thing is just a, a point. You said before that one of the things that concerned you was that Japan now seemed to be operating without a strategy and was just sort of reacting in an ad hoc fashion. I put it to you that maybe it has ever been thus <laughs> in <laughs> Japan's strategic planning. Um, my question, though, uh, directly is how do you view the role in of, of nationalism in determining Japan's strategic choices. Well, you just talked about the democratic deficit and, and the need for sort of democratic foundations of, of, of strategic policy. So, you know, especially with regards to Senkaku, what's the role of, of, of sort of nationalism in, in Japan's foreign policy making and strategic policy making? And just on that subject, I note there's a, a recent cabinet office poll that puts um, something like 90% of Japanese saying they do not feel affinity with um, China, so, so qu quite high, and, and the timing of the changes Go of that figure. poll yeah. seems mm. to be sort of related to what's yeah. happening in the, in yeah. the Senkaku Dayutai dispute. Oh. So, thanks. Uh, nationalism is being opportunistically uh, manipulated by um, the political sphere in Japan and China. Um, it's being done not in a crass way that we can point to and say, oh, um, sloganeering, propaganda. Um, it, it sounds insignificant, but in China, the Senkaku Islands now appear on the nightly news on the weather map. We know how those goats are doing down in the Senkakus, whether they're wet or dry, right? <laughs> this is a, a, quite a sophisticated way of conveying national identity and national pride. Um, there are many other things going on in both countries. I think what it does is provide Abe in a circumstance where a referendum now has to have a, a majority, a bare majority, rather than anything higher to pass. It makes the um, relevance and uh, manipulation, mobilisation of popular feeling a significant political factor. Um, whether there's never been any strategy in Japan, I, I think the 2010 um, National Defence Program guidelines were very coherent, very well thought through, extremely well suited to the threat environment um, facing Japan and uh, frankly I'm disturbed that a good plan like that has been ditched uh, midstream. And I'm wondering what could possibly uh, replace it um, other than beefing up the north again uh, to complement the southwest. I, I really don't know. But it's a, it's a big question. There's a second lunch lined up right there. <laughs> and I appreciate the question. Thank you. Before you get too many lunches, Ricky, we'll have one, one more last one question over here. Thanks very much for a really interesting talk. Um, Amy King here at the ANU. Um, I just wanted to push you a bit, I guess, on these labels, pragmatism and ideology, because I think um, 
outside of your talk, they are labels that can be used in all sorts of ways. I mean, pragmatic behaviour can describe all sorts of things. And a lot of the ideological behaviour you were describing actually seems highly self-interested, rational behaviour to me. Um, so I'm wondering if perhaps a better way or perhaps a different way of framing this might be looking at, well, who is the primary audience that RB is targeting here? Is it the US, Southeast Asia, other alliance partners? A lot of the, um, the decisions you seem to suggest seem to be targeting that and really buying into the, the US pivot strategy. Is it a domestic <coughs> electoral strategy? And, and who is he you know, pr prioritising and when? So I think yeah. ideology masks actually a highly rational domestic policy situation. Um, now, those two things, obviously, as you say, are not necessarily cohesive, but um, I just, I, I find, yeah, the, the pragmatic ideology thing a little, a little unhelpful, I suppose. Yeah, um, I appreciate that. Pragmatism, um, to my mind, is, is primarily aimed at an international or foreign audience with the US at the top of the queue. Um, the, what I've been calling ideology, I, I agree with you, um, there is a rationality. I'm not, I am not for a moment suggesting that Abe is out of his mind. Uh, he has a very deliberate strategy and as you say, this suggests its own rationality. But when we're talking about um, uh, realism in policy terms, particularly in defence terms. That suggests a hard power, um, hardcore power-centric logic. And irrational refers to things like identity, uh, norms, values, whatever you want to call them. And I think Abe is in his own rational way um, trying to be consistent with his own um, normative uh, framing of security as a national identity issue domestically, while internationally in foreign policy and, fo and security policy, he is um, not silly enough to alienate um, his number one alliance partner, the US, without which Japan does not have a viable independent security capability and certainly not one that involves the ability to deter um, nuclear attack. So everything has its own rationale, but I, I, I see a clear divide and, and yes, you're right, it's the audience that helps us delineate those two dimensions of his policy. There's your pen. You have a seat. Thanks. Um, could I just say a few thank yous before we wrap up this evening? First and foremost, I'd, I'd like to thank um, Ricky very much for that very thoughtful presentation and um, coherent set of answers. I think the great strength of that address this evening um, really was the way in which you spelt out both a conceptual framework for this issue about the future of Japan's security policy and some of the practical policy issues with which Japan and other countries are wrestling as a result. Um, and I think that's always a useful way to, to frame these kinds of um, uh, complex issues. And so the way you brought together uh, historical and contemporary issues, political and economic issues, um, issues of um, domestic and foreign policy, um, I think reflected both the complexity and the, the challenges we face in this area. So Ricky, on behalf of all of us, I'd like to thank you very much for, for doing that. Um, I think the fact that so many people have come this evening um, is an indicator both of your standing and also of the, the relevance of this issue um, to a lot of people uh, in Australia and the region. And I think you um, asked the hard questions and you gave some, some very clear views that we all appreciated. So thank you very much. Could I also um, thank all of you for coming? I mean, I know at the end of, uh, end of a day it's not the, the thing that people look forward to at six o'clock, but I think um, the fact that so many of you came and the fact that you're drawn from such a, a disparate um, range of interests. There are people here, of course, from the national security community in government. There are members from the uh, diplomatic community, uh, obviously people uh, from the ANU, uh, there are many alumni of the National Security College 
uh, here this evening, uh, as well as other students of the ANU. Um, uh, there's also a range of interested people from the wider community, and I think these kinds of audiences um, uh, reflect the genuine sense of outreach into which the, the college is uh, committed and the fact that you have responded in the way you did um, we're very appreciative of and we certainly hope that you'll come back to, uh, to future occasions. Can I also finally just say a few thank yous to people in our operations here at the ANU that have made this possible. It, it seems seamless and um, smooth but beneath the water there's a lot of paddling. Um, and I'd very much like to, um, to thank uh, Christina and Naomi and Darren from, uh, from the college. Um, I'd also like to thank Satomi and Hiroki and Kana from the College of Asia and the Pacific who have given us a hand here tonight. And of course, uh, to the ANU Japan Institute with whom we've been hosting this occasion. So thank you all very much. Um, uh, I'd ask you to keep a look on, on our website for the next public seminar in this series. We hope to do around seven or eight this year. Um, and certainly we hope that they attract the same level of interest. Thank you very much.